um, let's show uh, let's show off some uh, uh, Grimm's web pages again. Oh, I already almost knocked over my beer. What the hell? Stupid. Uh, we've got that one, and then I want to. This is where we can get crazy. So, by crazy, I mean look at us. Uh, how crazy can we get? Um, <laughs> I, I ran out of energy drinks, so I might. Start oh God, no way! Now. So share screen. Uh, just gonna do that. Once again, boom, let's bring this up. Oh, Shadzar wants steak. Look at him. Well, Shadzar, there, there's no giveaway for I want steak. Yeah. It's only a giveaway for I want stuff. <laughs> anyway, all right, so post-mortem studios. don't want my meat. Ooh, burn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will second that. I don't want his meat either. <laughs> um, so uh, post-mortem studios, remember, if you look at this first one, he's got yet another giveaway. Like, there's all types of weird giveaways going on. Get his stuff, man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've got a big, big box of stuff that I'm giving away if you help me promote myself. So mm -hmm. go check the blog. So got that there. Chat out. And uh, let's go to, let's check story games this time. Dungeon, uh, diversity dungeons. I actually, I was uh, talking to Hidden Dog, like, why aren't we looking at this? Because I'd go crazy over this one probably, um, but maybe not. I don't know. To go to my actual store, because that's the blog post that, to do with the shop. You'll have to go to. Oh, oh crap, crap, crap. Sorry, I I don't have it set. I have it set up the other way. I, I wanted to set up the quick way this time, and I did not do that. So <laughs> there we go. Now it's set up the quick way. Now you can see what I'm seeing. All right. Uh, so anyway, diversity diversity dungeons. Look at that. Yeah. So pundit Jeez. thought that was a um, that was me making fun, but it's actually me and a couple of anonymous friends approaching diversity issues in gaming in the way that we want to mm -hmm. so that's not to ignore it but to provide ways in which you can account for and play up to bigotry and disability uh, and that sort of thing so see 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 here's the thing for for me in this first of all i want everybody to play games i don't care who you sleep with i don't care what you do with your life okay but i also believe that mockery is not hatred and if at your table, you have some rules, let's say I go to your table and you say, look, you know, uh, some of us at this table ha have, you know, uh, uh, you know, mental issues as per the blood game, and we don't like those discussed. I am going to respect that to the best of my ability. However, I do call people retards, for example. I, it's something I say. I call people asshats. I call people, you know, and, and the thing is, I don't get butthurt when people call, you know, me certain names and so forth. So I try to respect people as much as possible, but I really get... There, there are certain certain things I just will not cater to. I'm old, and I don't accept it, and, you know, you be you, I, and I will defend your right to be you and to have your beliefs. If anybody tries to take them away from you, I'm there with you, but I'm still going to mock you for them. And that that's the way I feel. He, you know, Heathen Dog tends to be a little more rational about it than me. If I know a word's going to, you know, kind of like you were talking about with the game Blood, if I know a word is going to upset somebody, I try to make sure I can say it at all times. Because I'm a firm believer in sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, I'm a contrarian. If someone tells me I can't do something, I want to do it twice as hard and twice as long. <laughs> so, so you you understand at least even if you don't agree with me, you understand where I'm coming from well, with that. Yeah, my my take is that I take responsibility for my issues, and if I'm having a problem at someone's table, I will politely make my excuses and I will leave. I will not hold them to account for doing something that I don't like. I will not go and complain to the store owner or the convention runner or, or anything else. You know, my issues are my responsibility, not anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And if a game doesn't look like it's something I want to participate in, I won't participate in it. I won't even <laughs> sign up to it. <laughs> yeah. so, so I, I would hope that you would talk to, say, somebody like me. Because a lot of times I don't know, and a lot of times I am saying, so especially like in this segment, in this segment right here. See, I don't go to conventions... And like, okay, who can I piss off? I never do that. I go to conventions to sit down at a table like, are we ready to play the game? But the first time somebody comes to me and says, uh, my character goes by the pronoun they, I'll be like, no, unless you have multiple personality disorder, I will never I will never cater to that for you, ever, in my life. Well, that's what I go by. I don't care what you go by. I'm using the English language, and I don't accept that. Uh, yeah. You can be you know, a he or a she. Which, which one do you pronounce more, the he side or the she side? And I will absolutely give you that. Um, if somebody says, well, my orc, and I've seen this, this is why I'm saying this. My orc is actually transgender. What? No, it's In a not. fantasy game? No, you're not. 
like, like, well, this is how I identify. No, your orc is an orc. First of all, why are you playing an orc? You know, now if the game is a, a, a completely different type of game, for example, and I go to, I'm using you, Grim, because you're our guest here. I go to your table and you say, hey, in my world, this actually exists. There is magic that, look, if you have magic that can put people to sleep and you have magic that can levitate people, why can't you have magic that can, you know, make somebody feel more comfortable in his or her own body? I will say, okay, but I'm still going to call somebody a him or a her. I am not going to call somebody a they ever in my life. And I will risk getting fired over that. Uh, mm. th that would be like the only place that I would be disrespectful. Other than that, I'd be like, yeah, I'm, if that's your game, if that's your world, if that's, I I'm there for you. I want to enjoy this. I'm not here to make waves. At the same time, I don't like that. Cra I don't understand why it has to be put in the game. Like, I don't care about some NPC who some NPC sleeps with unless it's pertinent to the story. Yeah. And that's the best. That's or You talk about, or was it organic inclusion or natural yes. inclusion? Oh, I, I forgot to do that for segment two. Uh, I'll do that after you're done. Okay. So, yeah, that's the way I would prefer to go about things. You know, mm -hmm. you have the gay characters, but it's, they just happen to be there. It's not like they're announcing themselves constantly, like happens in computer games and so on. You know, you you know that they're transgender because they say it every five minutes in the in the game dialogue or, or whatever. Just just have it happen. I mean, mm -hmm. the shows and the games and the books and things that I think handle this better are the ones that it's just there. It's not a big song and dance. And when you're playing historical games, you know, these weren't the most tolerant periods. And I think it's disrespectful to the people that had to struggle against that mm -hmm. to erase it from history just because you're playing in that point in history and one of your players decides they want to play someone who who is whatever. You should mm -hmm. incorporate that those issues in the past, even though characters are obviously usually exceptional people. I mean, if you're playing a Victorian game and someone is playing a woman, that's going to present issues in mm -hmm. the game but even so there were famous adventuresses and you know oh women of power and, women right. in politics uh, you know but it, it, exactly but it, it's still an issue of the time and it's disrespectful mm -hmm. to the struggle of women towards equality to erase that history mm -hmm. um that's way more yeah. thought-provoking than me but but i but i do feel you're absolutely spot on uh i don't even want i don't even want to say more because I'll, I'll ruin what you said yeah. and I, I mean that okay. uh, <laughs> Because I think you hit it right on the head. I do want to tell Todd Zercher, I hope you sign up on um, on Twitch because I don't think it works through. It, it won't. It won't. I, yeah, it won't work on YouTube. You'll have to go into Twitch. I'm sorry, but that's that. That's our main platform, and that that's what we're set up to give away stuff on. <laughs> Ambrose Fox, I, I gotta ask, are you one of Elgarian's Shout of the Avatar folks? Because. Uh, so, so Grim, I, I'm still showing stuff from your from your page. That's why I haven't uh, shrunk all this yet. But uh, <laughs> we used to be actually pretty huge. Algarian streamed a game, Shroud of the Avatar, done by Lord British uh, and so forth. Um, but uh, he ended up taking a job with them, and uh, when he left, uh, our entire our, our entire viewership, viewership went down <laughs> because they were here for that game. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, because they're they're more here for that game than anything else. So we're actually regrowing our channel. That's why if you like look at our Discord, like wow, you got so many people in your Discord, but nobody talks. People talk. Uh, Shads oh. are talks. I, I hope I've brought a few people over to you. I've got a fairly loyal but small audience. Do you want to talk about gore? It's a bit controversial. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's controversial. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so. Well, it says it right here. This game deals with complex adult themes. Well, first of all, people don't know how to be adults anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the Gorean Novels is a series of, I think, now over 30 books uh, by a philosophy professor and uh, classics, I think he does as well, uh, who's very old now. He wrote originally started writing these in the 60s, mm. and they're fantasy novels, but they also deal with kink. And because of that, they've been taken to be uh, misogynistic and anti-feminist and so on. But to me, they're fantasy novels that also incorporate kink, which I like, and the world building is really good. And the classical influence is is very present. The sort of analogs to ancient Greek and and Roman states and so on. But I've got no end of trouble for, for, for doing this. Um, it's like people don't understand that it's fantasy. 
Is it because they were just exposed to it through the game, or are they people that have been trying to lord over the oh, original? So there was some bad reaction to it when it first came out um, from sort of second wave feminist groups and so on at the time, and people concerned about the adult content. You know, things used to be a lot more censorious back then, but it's even worse now because they were still being sold back then. They were just being moved to the top shelf or whatever. Now it's only really e-published and, and print-on-demand published, even though he's still producing books. Um, but it's just such a such a compelling world that I wanted to do it, and I've yeah. wanted to do it for a very, very long time. Um, and just as with Blood, it was just a matter of asking. I finally managed to get hold of his actual agent and came to a deal and put the, put the game out. I employed uh, a fetish artist called Michael Manning, whose artwork, as you can see, is, is really striking and really good. And it's just, I think it's a really good setting. I think it's one of my best products. If, be if you were to give a, like a boilerplate or an elevator pitch to somebody right now about, about this game, let's just say there's somebody in our audience who doesn't know anything about this. What would you, what would you say in just a few seconds about why somebody should get this game? It's a more realistic bar zoom with a heavy kink element and a more realistic social structure and it plays with gender and gender roles in a transgressive way that few people dare to do anymore about anything um so i think it's it's engaging and interesting in that way in in the exercise of putting yourself into an almost entirely alien mindset and and playing within that so so somebody who lived a sheltered childhood lutheran school and all that <laughs> who Compare this to Ralph Bakshi. Oh, well, yeah, he's probably a good um, a, a good point of comparison because Bakshi's really? okay. pretty Bakshi's pretty transgressive. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at something like Wizards, oh, I love example. Wizards. I've got the Wizards role playing game. Love it. Cool. Haven't, haven't, <laughs> haven't actually played the game. I love the movie, um, but uh, I got the Wizards role playing game. Of course. Now, I mean, for me personally, just I'm not. No judgments. I actually, I'm glad it's out there. I thought Fritz the Cat was a little over the top. Like, yeah. was it wasn't my thing? A, you know, again, I, I that whole combination of bestiality and so forth just it just went through my brain. I couldn't take it for what <laughs> allegory it was probably trying to give. But uh, you know, I I knew him from Lord of the Rings. I saw Wizards and I saw Fritz the Cat. It's like whoa. Um, but yeah, yeah. To okay. to the extent that maybe Fritz was a sort of commentary film. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, I, I would say Wizards is a commentary film as well on a, on a lot of topics. I would say that Gore is a commentary on gender relations and gender politics in a way. If you want to take it seriously, okay. if you don't, then it's just a kind of sexy sword and planet sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay, sounds uh, sounds interesting to me. Uh, well, hopefully that whoever wins something might take a look at that. Uh, this is the thing. This is what I. Mm, this is what I like about this. These are things that I personally would not get exposed to because I would see the cover of this or I would see, wow, yay, Diversity and Dungeons, what do I care? Or I'd see something <laughs> like Gore and be like, oh, look, indie game, or Blood, oh, look, another horror game, and so forth. And after looking through it, after talking with Grimm, uh, I mean, I, I can't lie and say, oh, I'm going to go run right out, and I'm going to go play this game. I, I have to look at the games behind me, and that's not even my full catalog. I can't say that. But what I can say is that if this is your thing, how are you not buying uh, buying this? I mean, this is honestly, this is the counterculture. This is the niche. This is this fills a void that literally isn't out there. If somebody else were to come on here and be like, well, I fill the void because I don't like that Dungeons and Dragons has long rest. That's just a tweak. I mean, to be honest, Castles and Crusades, we loved it. But did that really fill a void that was missing somewhere, Heathen Dog? Not really. Right. We used, we used to call these fantasy heartbreakers where someone would obviously spend an awful lot of time and money and love on producing what was basically D and D with one rules tweak mm -hmm. and, and put it out and then it would just disappear and all, all that money and time and effort and love had gone third edition and the open gaming license and the old school renaissance movement have made fantasy heartbreakers more of a of a going concern something that you can actually get out there and sell because you can just tie in to the main rules and you know you don't have to put as much work in and there's a there's a built-in audience so it's not it's not the the death knell that it used to be 
So um, you just saw a slide across my screen there. I actually have a little notepad document of a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. And, and cool. one of them actually, uh, right from that. So my question is this, and, and I'm going to follow it up with just a small amount of commentary, is are there too many games? And so the, the, the reason why I asked this is, so I wrote down, personally, I'm sick of seeing new game after new game after new game. I mean, really, what is the point? So you've already answered this part, and we've already talked about this part, what makes your game different, but like, let's look at me for just a second. No, I'm not trying to segue in this all about me, but I'm actually writing my own game. But I, one of the reasons why I've kind of stopped doing it is because I keep looking at Kickstarter for the last couple of months, and I'm just like, everybody's writing their own new game, and most of them aren't anything I'd be interested in, and... Oh, why do I want to throw me out there? Why It just seems like it's inundated with mostly crap when I could just go back there and play D&D, Astonishing Swordsman Sorcerers, Battletech, Earthdawn, uh, I've got the old World of Darkness stuff. I mean, you can kind of see my, my list back there. I mean, and I, and I have some other niche games like Riddle of Steel. Uh, um, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Hmm? Though it never really, Riddle of Steel is a good game, but it never really took off. So Heathen Dog and I play tested it many years ago, and one of the reasons that we didn't end up liking it, or at least I didn't like it, is because we did combat with it, and I wanted to test a Bruce Lee versus somebody in in uh, armor, and the person armor won one hundred percent of the time. There was no chance in hell for the Bruce Lee person to win, and I'm like, well, that's great, but that's just what that's going to lead to is everybody's just going to be, uh, you know, a knight in shining armor. That's it. Okay. Um. So. I mean, I'll answer everything, but I just want to make people aware that I do consultancy for indie developers. Crap, do I owe you money now? Uh, <laughs> tw 20 bucks an hour. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> um, so if anyone out there is thinking of producing their own game and wants any insights, you know, I am available for hire. Um, God, it's so un-British shilling yourself. I hate it. But, um, <laughs> by, all me by all means, if I knew to shill this part of you, I would have done it. So shill yourself. <laughs> Please do. And I've nearly finished a video series that I'm going to sell at a pretty reasonable price. I haven't quite decided on the price yet. Ban Krantz. Ban him. Ban him right now. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, Grim, <laughs> but he said something really dumb in chat. I want to ban this instant. That, that is not really dumb. Oh, you banned my wife. Well, yeah, she, she's got to come in though. No, All right. uh, okay. go ahead, Graham. I'm sorry. I have a question. It's okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I've nearly finished this video series. I've got one video left, which will take you through the process of RPG design from, from start to finish and oh, cool. has a lot of my insights. And, oh, awesome. And so I'm on. looking. Yeah, I'd absolutely so, take a look at that. So that'll be along soon. Okay. Are there too many games? Yes and no. There's always room for a niche. If you've got a unique selling point, you've got something that you are particularly sold on, then, yeah, there's always room for something more, something new. People are always hungry for something new. You know, even mm -hmm. if something's been done, if you can put a new spin on it or present it in a really interesting and new way, yeah, there's always room for that. But the market is flooded. In the same way that ebooks have have flooded the the fiction market with trash. Yes. So got, oh God. Yes. So the problem is not creating something good necessarily, or getting something good out there necessarily. The the problem is getting it seen and, and getting people to understand what your unique selling point is. Yeah. You know, what it, what it is that you have to offer. Yeah. Does your that, spin create value? Yeah. Yeah. So. If you're doing a fantasy game, I mean, the first question you've got to ask yourself is, is there already a game out there that's current that does what I'm doing, but better or at least as competently as I am? Yeah, and I think it's important to set your expectations low. Um, I have a saying, <laughs> a pessimist can only ever have a nice surprise. Because <laughs> if you're always expecting the worst and something works out, you know, that that's... That's a good thing. So if you set your expectations low, if you don't go into it expecting or needing to make a profit, or whatever, that's kind of freeing, and you you can you can you can approach it with a more open mind, and you won't be so knocked back if it doesn't set the world on fire. Yeah, or... there's there's less fear of failure if yeah uh, if you know there there is no huge uh, expectation of success. Well, do I have it, no no it. intention of uh, quitting my day job, so uh, you know yeah. I'm not worried about that, but. I mean, I don't know anything about your game. 
So I can't, I can't really give any specific keep it a advice. Secret. Yeah, there's there's one person that knows. There's one person that generally knows about the game, and I, let me tell you, his criticism has been so constructive that he stopped me from writing. So, <laughs> so uh, hang on, hang on. Ravensler has a question about uh, mm-hmm. about Gore. He says, uh, "Where did you get the map of Gore, or have, or is it an official copy or one you drew?" So there's various versions online um, that people have made. I took the ones that seemed to be roughly in accord with each other and i gave them to a map maker and i said look can you try and consolidate this so that it makes sense um and that and they put it together for me so i would say my map is probably the closest to an official map that you're going to get and if you know gore then my map of gore is meant to be the um the tiled floor in uh, Samos's room in Port Car. So there you go. You actually answered two questions at once, and I'm saddened by that. I had... <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, what else? I want to make sure that I ask the other one. We already answered that, yeah. Okay, so the other question I had, this is back on Blood. Um, so what was the intent with creating a second edition of it? Why, why did you feel that Blood needed a second edition? Or if you want now, why do you feel it needs a third edition? Uh, well, the first edition was the one by Underground Games. It was very obscure. This was sort of, well, it was pre-internet, you know, 1990. Mm-hmm. And I loved it so much, I thought it deserved to still be out there. Um, so with the advent of you know, PDF games and print-on-demand, I thought, well... I love it. I want it to stay in print. I'll see if the guy's willing to let me do a second edition. So I did, uh, because I didn't just want to reproduce the first edition, and besides, they'd lost the files, so it couldn't be be done in any case. Uh, Plus, I think it was on an old pre-1990 Macintosh or something, so translating the files wouldn't exactly have been easy. I think it needs a third edition, because with the second edition, I just really wanted to recreate and update what already existed and now i've got ambitions to change things make it more accessible and bring it to a completely new audience rather than just nostalgic people and people who love obscure games because i think there's still something there's something to it do you think somebody that has the nostalgia for those games like somebody like me who's kind of a grognar in terms of i don't like any of the modern versions of any of the watts dnds i hate them all um and I hate them in terms of the fact that I'm not necessarily saying that they're bad games, but they're not Dungeons and Dragons. They've, they've just flipped mm. Dungeons and Dragons on its head as far as I'm concerned. However, a game like the Palladium system, where it stayed true, even with its revised and second edition, really stayed true to its roots. So somebody like me, who's a grognard, who may actually have either owned the game or looked the game or loved the concept of the original one, is there going to be something there that, that still speaks to that person? The, the heart of the game will still be there, and I never take down old edi- older editions of my work. It's always still available if you want it. Um, or if you want to get a deeper understanding of the newer edition, you'll always have the option to go back and look at the older editions. Um, I just don't see any point in removing anything from sale. It's just... It, yeah. Just as long as, as everyone, as long as everyone knows, it's not the most up to date edition. Right, right. It, it, yeah, as as long as it's uh, properly labeled, it's fine. Uh, yeah. The Insomnia Jack has a question. It it tends to help if your unique selling point is being a diverse SJW nowadays. Now, <laughs> I have to disagree with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna say my my piece on that one first. Uh, if if you if you cater to uh, social justice, you have a greater ability to get the your name seen but they are notorious on twitter actually buying anything Mm. they yell about it they scream about it or they'll laud it and say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread but they're not going to buy it and can i I piggyback on that for for a second because i because i want to say this specifically because grim's here you know grim you said yourself that you're that you're counterculture that yeah. uh, and that I mean, obviously, you've already talked about kink. You've been very uh, visceral and descriptive in in a game like that. I don't consider what you do as SJW. I don't. No. I consider it libertine. 
I, I consider it, uh, you know, artistic, which I think we talked earlier. I kind of say is a bad way, but I'm saying it actually in the good way this time. But I absolutely don't see anything that even the videos that I watch of yours, that get a little more political that I am like, no, I see you as coming from a place of thought, not a place of just like reaction. I want it my way, you know, so I don't see anything you've done as SJW. So if and so the reason I'm saying this is, you know, Heathen Dog says, don't do the SJW thing. And, and uh, that the commenter said, hey, that's a way of getting seen. I don't think you need that to be seen. But from your perspective, what, from the comments you've received, are you getting hit more from the puritanical 80s people, the Christian conservatives, or are you getting hit by the modern pur uh, puritanical people, the SJWs? Uh, this might be a long-winded answer. Please, by all sure means. I, I want to make sure I've covered all my bases. Um, so I would say that I am what some people call the dirtbag left, <laughs> um, which is a more old-school, class-oriented, left-wing, left, left anarchist sort of set. And we have no tolerance for censorship. And the term woke scold, which you've probably come across, mm -hmm. I prefer that to social justice warrior. And that comes out of the dirtbag left to describe these people. Okay. Now, to me, social justice warriors are not left wing at all because they're not egalitarian. They're authoritarian. Yep. They believe in hierarchies. They create hierarchies. Even if they're taking a normal hierarchy and turning it on its head, they're still creating a new hierarchy where the more axes of oppression you have, the more value you have as a person rather than vice versa. To me, that's just as bad either way. Um, and I find it offensive. <laughs> Probably not the right word to use, but I find it offensive because it is utterly counter to left-wing ideology, historically speaking. Politically speaking, I have an education in history and politics, um, and it just runs counter to everything that I believe, everything that I know. Uh, about these things because it's so hierarchical and authoritarian mm. and, sen and censorious and yet we wouldn't have the lgbt liberation that we've had we wouldn't have had the women's liberation that we've had without free speech free expression and i don't see the point and i see a lot of danger in pulling the ladder up behind you i mean we already we already know that we already see that the the left, what I call the pseudo left, this intersectional social justice left, they're losing the ability to argue. They will just try and shut you down. They won't try and yes. make the case. But you know, ten You're years racist. ago, racist. End a conversation. Yeah, but ten years ago, twenty years ago, we made the argument, and we won. Right. <laughs> so, and I think the nineties was a lot more of a of a tolerant and open and accepting decade than than now is because we still had that that commonality of equality egalitarianism treating everyone fairly not not treating people differently because of their race or their gender or their sexuality or whatever else and that's all been lost now we have to center it in these people's thinking and that just well look look at the world how divided are we now along all of these lines and i see it as being precisely because of these people who claim to be fighting against all of these things mm -hmm. So I get, I get it from both sides, but lately I do get it more. Well, I say lately for the past 10 years, I have been getting it more from this pseudo left. What's, what's interesting. I, I'm glad you said that 10 year thing because yeah, in, it, in, 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 in look, I'm sorry, go on. No, it's, yeah, it's exactly 2010. Um, a couple of years before that, I brought out a, a card game called Hentacle, which is very, <laughs> very, very, very pornographic. Um, but it was a, a woman that did the art, a woman of color, no less, who did the, who did the art for me for that. And to start with, everyone understood the joke. Uh, I think it was about 2007, maybe I first brought it out. But at 20, in 2010, it was about the time I got kicked off RPG Net, someone was saying that I was selling fetishized child porn, which I absolutely... Well, it is <laughs> RPG Net. I think everybody gets kicked off of there. Yeah. So. Which, which I absolutely wasn't, but that was like my first, what the, what the entire and actual fuck moment was, was that mm -hmm. kind of accusation. And then it's gotten worse ever since you got people trawling through old work that I did. Like I've worked for Mongoose publishing, right? Then that was directly after I'd done the Munchkin's Guide to Power Gaming. So they wanted to employ me to do comedy books. 
Um, so I did the Slayer's Guide to Female Gamers, which was not making fun of, of women in gaming. It was making fun of the stereotypical nerd who is awkward with women in, in gaming. Us! Oh, great! <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and all kinds of myths and stupid misapprehensions and stuff like that. And yet people reacted to that as though it were sexist towards women without ever having read the book. There was a, distribu there yeah. was a distributor in the United States who refused to stock it because he thought it was a book about killing women. What? <laughs> I, I, I know, right? And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse since that. I mean, here's me, a dyed-in-the-wool lefty since I was first politically aware, dedicated to e equal rights, you know, every genuine social justice type thing you you could care to mention i'm for it and yet <laughs> they hate me but and all i can make out is it's because i'm sex positive um because i prioritize free expression free exchange of views above where they do it, it's it's bewildering and it used to be really damaging to my self image and self esteem because i couldn't figure out why on earth these people hated me so much but I've learned to just care less, I guess. Well, well let, let, let me tell you something as somebody who is definitely on the right wing of politics, um, who will tell, who, who will agree with you. Yep. We lost you won. <laughs> you know, in, in the nineties. Uh, and, but I don't think it's a bad thing. And that might surprise some people, but I don't think that was a bad thing. You know, sometimes you have to admit you're kind of on the wrong side of history. Now I'm not saying I disagree with those beliefs. I think they've just transformed in a way that whether you call it justification or rationalization, so on and so forth, I still have a lot of those beliefs. But I also learned the term libertarianism. That's why I also mm. tell people, no, I'm not fully libertarian. No, no, no. I believe there are lines in the sand, but I'm also not fully Republican either, you know, because uh, they're authoritarians and I'm with you on the whole authoritarian thing. And yeah. well, I may never engage in what you engage in and I may not, necessarily want uh, one in my house or something you tell me anytime somebody this is more proverbial than actual because i probably couldn't do anything if i wanted to but <laughs> you tell me that somebody's trying to stop you from doing it and i will be on your side instantaneously because right, you that's, that's the crux of it isn't it right however much we might disagree on something i think you should be allowed to do what you want and it, as long as it doesn't harm anybody absolutely and you would agree that I should do whatever I want yes. as long as it doesn't harm anybody. And you should be free to mock me for being some sort of weird Puritan that, oh, look at the, <laughs> look at the little Christian guy. And I'm not even Christian, but, you know, oh, but, look at him, Bible thumper. And I should be able to mock you for wearing a, well, an awesome looking, but a weird hat, you know? <laughs> yeah. But they think that what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom, head, book, game, what, somehow harms society. And I, I, I don't see it. It's comfort I zone, understand. I think. Hey, based on somebody who was there, I, I think it's comfort zone. Look, I, look uh, without getting too political, I was on the wrong side of, you know, the, the gay, homosexual marriage, so on and so forth thing. Uh, I still have my issues with it, but they're not based on somebody's orientation or sexuality. They're based on something totally different. Um, I, think it, I think it's another one of these generational things as well. I mean, you lived through the satanic panic. Yes, as I went to I. Lutheran school while that was going on. Uh, I, I can promise you, I, one of my favorite shows, hey, as a Brit, maybe you'll appreciate this. I love the old Doctor Who. But mm. if you talked about that during my, uh, my, my first Lutheran church that I went to, where I went to Lutheran school, that was, okay, now I have to memorize another hymn? Kidding yeah. me? So you I didn't mean, it, talk about it, it. It wasn't quite as bad over here, but it was bad. There were book burnings of D&D &D books, uh, a, a few of them. Um, there were religious groups coming into schools. There was this video called Doorways to Danger, which you can look up on YouTube and you can watch, and it's got this whole se segment about how D&D &D will lead you to Satan. And, uh, and oh, all this I, stuff. I, I had to learn it. Like They, they yeah. beat that into us in church school. <laughs> <laughs> but I think those of us who've lived through that will tend to have a strongly more small-L libertarian bent when it comes to these things and be extremely wary of censorship. Mm-hmm in a way that younger people perhaps don't um that i don't know whose cognition is distorted exactly there whether it's ours or theirs i mean i'm gonna say theirs <laughs> <laughs> yes but, uh, you know we we've seen what can happen when this gets out of hand and it's uh, i mean as a lefty it's heartbreaking to me to see the left be tarred with this authoritarian censorious brush 
to the extent where I get assumed to be like those people because I self-identify as as as, as being left wing, and mm-hmm. yet they, the things they say, the things they want, the things they do, are entirely 180 degrees with my values. Well, now, I, I imagine this is what uh, a lot of Republicans thought of Tea Party people. Like, where? <laughs> What? <laughs> well, the, the Tea Party thing got blown up. So I'll tell you yeah. right now, I was very pro Tea Party when it stood for exactly what it was supposed to stand for. Tax and enough already. Crazy. And then it went nuts. It taught went into gun rights and, and oil and, and libertarianism. And so, no, no, no. Tea Party only meant stop taxing me, fools. You know, yeah. that, that's all it meant. Anything. I'll, I'll tell you right now. And I'm telling this to the world out there because I've even had Tea Party people tell me I'm wrong. No, I'm not. If you think the Tea Party means anything other than we're taxed too much, then you don't know what the Tea Party is about. You no, have well, you've you've increased that agenda to some nth degree that doesn't exist. And I'm talking to Dana Loesch and her crazy gun. Uh, actually, I'm for well, it, exactly the same thing happened to the Occupy movement. Yes, right. It started out saying over. get money out of politics. Corporations aren't people, and you had a huge alliance of people who all agreed on that. And then people started bringing in all kinds of extra topics. And because it just, it's just like bills. I don't know how you do it in the UK, but it's like bills in the United States. I'm one of those people that's pro one bill, one law kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, we got this bill, but it's got like 15 riders on there to bridges to nowhere and people getting this and you know, the, yeah, the, the industrial war complex. And uh, it's not quite as bad here. You get amendments, um, but they are all related to that first law. It's not like you can tack on a bridge. To a, a, f- a, f- a free pig to everyone yeah, over the yeah. age of a hundred to a defense spending bill <laughs> right, or something. You can, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't, then you, can't you guys have that one right. Now, now to bring this back, so the reason why I was mentioning the 2010 thing, it really started hitting the U.S. around 2016. That's where I mm. really started noticing it. And I'm going to say this about your book. This is one of the things that I wanted I want to point out. Now, he, Keith and Dog, go mute yourself or, or go scream at the wall because about <laughs> what I'm about to say. <laughs> Is I went and looked through a ton of my uh, my books because I wanted to see kind of time frames and pretty much for the U- U.S. published books, it started again around 2016, 2018, depending on which company I was looking at. And that's the they them crap. And you did that in your book. And I was like, wow, this book was 2006. And he's saying when a character does this, they get. And I'm telling you right off the bat, that makes my eyes boil. My smoke comes out of my ears. I I just despise that because I was taught how to write gender neutral. And I'm not saying you have bad writing. I'm not saying that here. But 2006. (laughs) Right. But but no, but I'm even. Yeah. But none of my books, and I did everything from my D&D books to my Battletech books, to my Earthdawn books, to, to no name books. I grabbed my Heavy Gear books, which is a Canadian company. And I'm like, wait a second here. I never saw this before that. And not a single one of them between 2000 and 2010 had that. Now, now here, here's, here's I, my, my point. Sorry, okay. sorry. Just yeah. my, my point. This stuff seemed to have started in the UK before the United States. And from my friends who work for the Air Force in the UK, mind you, I, I work for the headquarters, you, you say, FF Africa. Um, so I talked to a lot of people out at Men with Hill, Crouton, uh, you know, and so forth. I probably shouldn't give all that up, but. That, that live out there and they talk with UK stuff. It really seems to hit harder and heavier in the UK more than it is even in the United States. And we're just now catching up with this. Like, I mean, Scotland at the airport, it says if you hear something offensive, report them to the police, really? Yeah. Um, so there's a few things to tackle here. I think. British uh, sorry, culture, I went on there. I know. It's fine. British culture is very class oriented. We're still very conscious of that, even though the old class system doesn't really exist anymore. And politeness, the way in which you say something, being accommodating to other people, um, metaphorically holding the door open for the person behind you, it's, it's very steeped in British culture. I don't think that was any conscious decision to, do, to use gender neutral language for me. Maybe a difference between... American English and and British English because Fair that's enough. when I say the player they it's the non specific other. Um, well, in in the last in the last year, we have four major sources that uh, that authorize proper grammar. Um, yeah, three of the four have picked up saying, at worst, do not correct they. It may not be considered appropriate, but do not correct it. Don't consider it wrong. The fourth one is still a holdout saying it is wrong. So three of the four major grammar sources, but that just happened this year. I mean, we had news reports of, of uh, 
Merriam Webster coming out, adding they and being promoted like, oh my God, it's the best thing ever to happen. Look, I understand language changes over yeah. time. I guess my problem is I'm getting kicked in the teeth with this crap. And, <laughs> and I and I learned how to be gender neutral. You can you yeah. say, and again, I'm not teaching you how to write. I, I'm kind of saying this just as, as a thing out there for people who may not have seen other episodes, where you can say, when characters do this, they get. You can say, yeah. when a character does this, he or she. You can say, a character who does this gets a plus five. You don't even have to have a pronoun in there. Pl- blah, blah, blah. And yeah. what, so, so when I see it, and this is just me talking, when I see it, I either see it as ignorance, I'm talking from an American audience, if you're telling me this is commonplace in the UK, I will not tell you, I mean, you're actually English. <laughs> we pretend to speak English. Um, uh, it's just, I see it as either ignorance, get an editor, or virtue signaling, and I hate you. <laughs> you, you, you so, just, yeah, I, I see what you mean. I don't think it, there it was um, any kind of deliberate attempt to use gender neutral language because i don't think i use gender neutral language See, i'm pro gender neutral language i just don't like the they them well, thing okay so we're talking about how the language naturally develops mm-hmm. it has been naturally headed towards they for a very long time um pre-2006 i, I can't argue okay. with that that doesn't aggravate me so much as when people try to deliberately and artificially change language so when White Wolf used to use she throughout their books. Drove me nuts. Really? Because See, in- now that didn't bother me at all because, okay, interesting, but, but, interesting. Because Lane, right? English does Lane. not have a male pronoun, right? Because in Old English... It's gender uh, neutral in and of itself. It's, yeah, a man was just gender neutral. Like, we, mm-hmm. we, still, we still retain that in, like, manhole... Mm-hmm. Or human, not in California. Mankind. You're not allowed to. Say, you're not allowed to say manhole Mankind. in California anymore. It's maintenance cover now. Right. So, so he and man was always the most inclusive. Now, in old English, you used a prefix to determine whether you were talking about a woman or a man. So you would say where man or with man, from where we get wife, and from where we also get werewolf, and and those kind of things. So that that's that. old. That's old, more Germanic English, but we've. Somehow the the male part, the where, has largely disappeared. He or man includes everybody. And we Mm. have special exceptional language for women where we say she. So that used to aggravate me because he wasn't actually excluding anybody. But using the pronoun she throughout the books was excluding. I think this is hilarious. Because I disagree with you on that. I see where you're coming <laughs> from, but it doesn't bother me. So that, that I love it. I, I'm telling you, this is what I, I love talking with people who think differently, but can talk intelligently about it. I, I, well, it, I, it, I, it. I love the free league publishing way of doing it. Free league puts the game master as she and puts the players as he. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I like that. But but yeah, it just, it just aggravated the piss out of me, particularly <laughs> because they were doing it to try and be inclusive. But you know, let's let's face up to the fact, right? The majority of the RPG audience is male. So if you use the pronoun she, you're excluding the majority of your audience. Ninety nine, not- well, ninety five percent probably. See, I never felt excluded by she, so I guess that's why it didn't bother me because I never, I never had a hang up with that. Like the people in the modern parlance, like, oh my god, you said he, that must mean, oh, uh, that that it's only for boys. Yeah. But no, it, it's the patriarchy that's talking. Shut up. Um, but that is mm-hmm. the way it has gone organically. And so I tend to write in a conversational mm-hmm. style. I don't tend to use formal English in my writing. So, and and they is how I find myself talking naturally without any effort. Sometimes. So I, I wrote notes on, on that topic because <laughs> I because I know at some point somebody's going to come back to me and say you gave Grimm a pass on this. You rail on this stuff every time you read it in a book. Well, actually, you just gave the answer. You yeah, just yeah, gave- I've, heard, I've heard you say that in conversational language. Yep, you, you give it a pass. I've heard you say it. I, and let's let's use White Wolf as the example because White Wolf kind of set the tone for this. White Wolf wrote, if you look at like the clan, so I know more about uh, Mage than I do Vampire. But if you read the clan books for Vampire, each one was written in the theme of the clan. The Malkavian one was written all nuts. The 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 Nosferatu, which is my favorite clan, was written you know uh, both ugly yet intelligent. You could tell their intelligence gathers. The Bruja was written, you know. And, and honestly, I mean, I saw grammar mistakes in your book. I saw things that are like, okay, really? The, the comma is supposed to go before, not after. But whatever. I mean, uh, and I'm horrible with commas. So I probably shouldn't market that. But the point, but, but, I, but I literally took it. I was like, wait a second. This book is trying to sell a tone. And that tone is the horror genre. 
the, the tone is that it's personable. The tone is that, I mean, this isn't, so I always go with the moniker that uh, a rule book is a technical manual and you must write it in the technical format. Where I draw the exception is literally in the book that you wrote. In a horror yeah. book, I, I would say in a comedy book like you talked about earlier, you have to write it in a different tone to portray the right message. So yes, if anybody comes to me later and says, you gave Grimm a pass, I did because I actually think, as Heathen Dog said, uh, about the casual conversation. I, I mean, I cringe, but I let it go. Uh, yeah. I, I, and I think that it's, it's appropriate, and you have to do that for that type of book. But now, yeah. if you were that, writing... That, that's, sorry, that, that, that's my style overall. I always try to be more conversational because I think it's a, it's a more pleasant read. Um, if you're reading the book and you're hearing me as if I'm your mate explaining the game to you. As a yeah. technical writer, that drives me batshit crazy. <laughs> it, it, yeah. but it, but but i i get it i, I absolutely I get it. that yeah but that's just the that's just the way i i prefer to go mm -hmm. i mean like, like i keep saying 2006 my my craft has progressed oh I but think. but but even i mean i i, I rail on all the modern games because like my favorite game that i ever ran earth on changed that right in the middle of its progress and that it's just to me it's yeah. such a sudden jarring change that your first two books are written one way and then you write a book that's completely different it's like i want to beat you with that book but, but um uh, there's also differences between american english and fair. the british english. i love games master at first i was like what the hell is that but now i actually like saying it. i like saying games master yeah. Um, I mean, things like comma placement, that differs. Does uh, it? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the exact instances. I know I get it wrong a lot as well, to be fair to, be fair to you. but That's where yeah, I always get corrected. When I write stuff, I always get corrected on my commas. I'm like, but that's where I when, naturally pause. <laughs> when your margins are razor thin, the editor is usually one of the first things you get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. But, no, no, but, but that's the other thing. I actually wrote that note down, is I didn't see that you had an editor in there. No. So... It's, I, I, I remember when I told you before, I don't usually blame the writer. I blame the editor. Writers are there to tell a story and to get words on a page and, and, and to tell what needs to be told. The editor's there to clean it up and, and make it. And, and Heathen Dog, have I been in any video we've ever done? Have I said anything differently than that? Okay. Have, have you read Transmetropolitan? I have not. It's I have a not. Brilliant, brilliant comic series about a journalist in a sort of cyberpunkish future. Transmetropolitan. Yeah, and at the beginning of that series, he's he's holed up in a compound outside the city, and outside the front of his compound, there are wooden spikes with skulls on them and a sign that says these were editors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh... I have had mixed experiences with editors, um, some terrible, some good. I use well, editors look at Castles like... and Crusades. They had a terrible <laughs> editor. Oh, no, they I, had I editors. Used... One of them was really good. <laughs> I use editors for my fiction, but not for my game books. Fair enough. And you know what? That right there is an answer. See, now that goes back to the whole thing we were talking about self-publishing, where it's like, I think self-publishing has ended up putting out a lot of trash. I'm not saying your stuff is trash at all. And if anybody takes it that way, they're reading into what I said. But um, you know, there is a lot of trash that's getting out there. And I also do think that the good side of self-publishing is that everybody can put their, can put what's in their brain out there. And I think I'm for that. I want yeah. everybody to have a creative outlet that they can put something out there. The bad side of it is I really do see, you know, the the detriment to the English language. And what I mean by that is I've had people tell me, well, it's a modern world. And with forums, nobody cares about English on forums and nobody cares about English here. I would think that with the access to English grammar rules, it'd be easier to stay true. And, I mean, if, and you think with everyone typing forum posts and texting all the time, more people would be better at English. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, the, the, the <laughs> problem with the with the quick and easy communication is that you you can't take your time to craft yeah. your message on paper. You have to fit it within 288 characters. That that means you have to create a new language, basically. Mm. To fit so my in next that game format. will be entirely written in emojis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Nice. It's absolutely going to happen. There, you're, you're, you're going to have the, the equivalent of, I, I forget... This was on a, a Ripley's Believe It or Not when I was a kid when I, I when I first heard this. But uh, the the shortest conversation over letter everywhere was an exclamation point, and then the person responded with a question mark, and that was it. <laughs> you know, that, and, and that, that was the, the shortest English conversation ever. And like, well, yeah. now we have emojis, and it's worse. It's gotten worse. Yeah, eight thousand plus years of linguistic development. We're back to hieroglyphics. Exactly. <laughs> right. we're back to nice. Damn it. 
So, so you're yeah, gonna uh, need another Rosetta Stone. What, what would they call it? The Emoji Stone. I don't know. The emoji Stone. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you, maybe you, in the future, people will be able to translate what we're saying now by watching the Emoji Movie. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you're you're talking about how you live in the UK and you have the standard of you know kind of talking with each other, you know, which is kind of hierarchical and so forth. I live in Germany, and the standard of talking here is no. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's the exact opposite of that. Like Germans find Americans like, why are you so overly pleasant? What are you talking about? We're Americans. We're like the rudest people on the planet. But a German person is like, I'm going to lunch. All right, I'm back from lunch. Okay, you know, it's it's just weird. Like when you talk to a German, where it's like, are you supposed to say hello? Like, but but I mean, the German people are great. Don't get me wrong, but they're just very direct. Unlike my wife, who's Japanese. <laughs> Japanese people are the exact opposite. If you want to get a Japanese person in a conundrum, make them try to say no. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Just say something like, hey, I'm coming over to your house tonight at 7 o'clock. Why do you America. have so many words for sorry in your Japanese language? <laughs> yeah, right. It's most inefficient. <laughs> My wife curses in English because they're really, I mean, the only way to curse in Japanese is like, I hope you have an unpleasant day, sir. Kind day to you. you know? <laughs> it doesn't have the same just have to yell, baka, and smash yeah, right, you over yeah. the head with a mallet. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, how ex Exactly. What does that say? Doctor Who emoji robots, L-O-K? What's L-O-K? Confused. By the way, everybody, uh, just to want to remind you, remember... Uh, we're going to give a uh, game away for Grim, and, and I'll talk to you after the stream, Grim, if, if you want to comment, if you want it to come from us. I, I, I Honestly, we surprised you with that, so I don't, I feel uncomfortable saying, hey, you should owe somebody that. But we'll, we'll talk about that after the stream, how we want to do that. But uh, hey, just type in exclamation point, I want stuff. And, uh, you know, free game off of Grim's site. I'm going to shut up for a moment because I know I talk a lot. So uh, is there anything so you want to talk about the horror genre as yes. a whole? And I didn't give you a chance Actually, to no, do that. Uh, so it was, it was the difference between uh, between the U.S. horror <laughs> and U U.K. horror. The, there, there are some subtle but definite differences in, in how we go about uh, telling the story, crafting the story and uh, playing it out in, in our role playing games and our cinema and everything like that. And you wanted you had some insights on that. I want to I want to hear about that. Uh, yeah, I did kind of briefly mention some of that. Um, it's hard to think where to start. <laughs> I, mean, I mentioned the post-apocalyptic yes. genre. Yeah, and, um, and your your first one was uh, 28 Days Later and, say, uh, Dawn of the Dead or, or Night of the Night Living Dead, stuff like that, as the, as the two, you know, examples. Yeah, so, I mean, in our post-apocalyptic fiction which i'm going to use as my as my lead in sure. there's a particular character to british post-apocalyptic fiction like say john wyndham day of the triffids that sort of thing um which has been kind of termed a sort of cozy, cozy apocalypse so people escape from the cities into the country and they set up this kind of bucolic countryside lifestyle with, and that's where they survive on a farm or in a manor house some, something like that. Yeah, to, the, me, to, that. That sounds reminiscent of uh, World War II where people sent their families in the country. Yeah, that probably was a big part of the yeah. kind of psychological effect. In America, I mean, crossing over to horror fiction, there's a whole subgenre of like the hills have eyes mm -hmm. or wrong turn or there's a sort of fear of the wilderness, whereas things are kind of reversed, I think, I think in... in in, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah right. I now that you now that you said that I see it, you know, Camp Crystal Lake, uh Cabin in the Woods. Um oh there's 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 plenty, but yeah, the the uh country. Isn't that odd is, though, considering we're a pioneer culture? I know, right? It's weird. It it really should be the uh the the quote unquote British way, because uh you know, in in our in our early days, you know, we were manifest destiny. The 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 unknown was just something to be conquered, not to be feared. But nowadays, the country or the woods or anything like that is considered a frightful area. It is considered a place of unknown, and the unknown is to be feared. I must, yeah. uh, I have to interrupt. Bar Geek just subscribed. That means we have another giveaway to do after, after the, by the way, we didn't mention it, but anybody who subscribes, new subscriber to the channel gets a free video game that I have to do off a spin wheel, which I don't have up and ready to go, but that's going to be after the show. So stick around after the show, Bar Geek, and we will make sure you get a video game. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, just, I want to say it's, it, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just a, a tendency. I mean, he looks like something like the Wicker Man, 
it's kind of reversed. Um, but even then, you can view that as uh, the police character heading to this island. He's an intruder. He's bringing civilization and whatever. So those elements are still at play. And that also brings in another really powerful element in a lot of British horror in that we have so much history everywhere. You can't take two steps without treading on something significant. And and we're very we're still very in touch with our pagan past. I mean, when Christianity came to the UK, it just sort of painted a, a thin layer of whitewash over a lot of the old pagan ceremonies. I mean, so where I live, church down there, supposedly there is a gravestone and if you walk around it seven times Widdishins, the devil jumps out and takes you away. Uh, someone saw a um, ghostly coach and horses up the other way. There was supposedly a suicide up on that hill that makes it haunted. Um, the parts of the roads are paved with old gravestones. <laughs> um, you can't, you just can't go anywhere without it happening. A, a village a short distance away, Werwell, uh, has a legend of a cockatrice that supposedly lurked there and was slain by a, a knight. And you've got the lantern worm. We've got a crusader knight in the in the church as well. You can't go anywhere without running into this. Maiden garlands, the obios, um, rituals around wells and so on. So, and the, it's an uneasy relationship with that pagan past. So you see a lot of horror, like Lair of the White Worm, for example, um, that, that taps into that, into that, ancient mythos the there's the, the something just out of view but that's also true of some european horror there's um french horror has a lot of that element as well so there's a lot of those kind of folk elements and demons that don't turn out to be demons but they're old horned gods or it, there's just so much of it and it's just it's just seeped into everything the ghost stories you name it whereas the u.s doesn't have as much history to draw on. Um, and I think... I think we just draw on violence. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you do draw on... <laughs> you do draw on Native Americans. Um, and various... I think we used to, but now with all the cultural appropriation nonsense and so forth going around, I think we're kind of scared to do that. It's a shame, because Bo Bone Tomahawk is really good. Have you seen that? I have not. Uh, that's that's a good one. I'm a bad um, person when it comes to horror. That's why I'm being muted most of the time here because I'm going to be <laughs> ignorant if I talk. I think it's Bone Tomahawk anyway. There's, there's a cannibalistic um, Native American tribe living living underground, sort of creeping creeping out and attacking people. It's horribly politically incorrect for the for this time. What was it called? I guess I think it's Bone Tomahawk. Let me just look it up quickly. Well, there there were reports of uh, of actual uh, Native American tribes that were cannibalistic. So, yeah, Bone Tomahawk, yeah. Kurt, Kurt right. Russell, 2015 movie. Oh, nice. Well, I was I was in Germany, so I'm totally away from American movies at this point. <laughs> um, I guess one thing where it's it's in the zeitgeist now. I guess both areas. Um, the idea of the other, the alien, some of this fear and hatred towards immigrants. You would think that horror would tap into some of that because it's something that I think a lot of people feel. It's too touchy in America right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's too visceral. It hits too close to home. To pe mm. People like to be scared. They, they, they like to see the boogeyman, but they don't want to identify with the bad guy. Yeah, so so the, I, the, the right would say, right wouldn't care, but the right would say, yeah. oh God, now we're going to look bad as the left is blasting the right for doing it. Every... Every literally everything that you do nowadays in the United States is political. You did that because of Trump, or you did that because of this. Like, no, can I just do this because I'm a human being? Like, yeah, I mean, like I say, I'm you know pretty left, pretty anti-border you know, for the most part. I mean, I think there have to be limits, but I find this all fascinating. Everywhere that someone gets uncomfortable, or the, or there's an idea that's interesting, I want to poke it and <laughs> find find something to do with it. Um, I'm with you on that. I think for different reasons, but I'm absolutely with you on that. So, like, there's this uh, zeitgeist of anti-colonialism. Well, Britain obviously had a very colonialist past. It's not all awful. Um, in India, we wiped out uh, the Thuggy cult or Tuggy cult, however you want to pronounce it, who were 
you know, straight up murdering people in the name of Carly in order to supposedly stave off the apocalypse. And we put an, a violent end to the practice of sooty, uh, where wives... Oh, that, which, that I don't know. Okay, so sooty was uh, this tradition where the women would be burned on the same pyre as their husband when he died oh. while they were oh. alive. Oh, that's... Um, yeah, okay. There's a famous quote about it. Uh, let me just see if I can find it to get and, it right. And I could be 100% wrong, but I thought it was always pronounced thudgy cult, but I don't know. <laughs> Fudgy cult, maybe. Because there's like two E's at the end of it, at least when I read it. Uh, I can't, I can't find the exact quote, but it's something like, "Oh, how dare you interfere with Sooty? It's our, or, or Sati, it, it's our culture, it's our right." And the the, the British officer yeah, there but it's said, stupid, well, so well, "Well, you," <laughs> he said, "You know, you go ahead, you you do your your cultural thing, and then we will erect a gallows and hang you as is right with our culture." <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it's it's. In, we're uneasy with legacy of empire, but I don't think it's entirely evil. I think there were things that we did that were good, and that's going to get me hated. And I think the bad definitely outweighs the good, but there's good there. There's new. Look, there's I, I have no things. British in me. I'm German Norwegian. Okay, so uh, thank you for the Vikings. You got them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but, but uh, yes, the Dane law. <laughs> yeah, Dane law. There you go. Uh, but. Here, it's a product of its times, and that's what I look at. I'm, I'm never going to sit here and say, oh, slavery is great. But if you look at it, well, first of all, it's still practiced right now, and it's been practiced all through human history. Colonialism had its ups, had its downs, but who are the British competing with? The French, the Dutch, especially when it came to Navy at the time, the oh, Portuguese. The, the Belgian Congo was a nightmare. Yeah, so, so my, my point is, is like, you could either throw your arms up in the air and say, we're going to take the high ground. This, somebody uh, commented on a YouTube comment, basically said, fighting fire with fire is, his exact words were, fighting fire with, fighting fire with fire is retarded. And I'm like, bullshit. That's the sign of a loser. I'm sorry, but if everybody's doing colonialism, the Germans, the Dutch, uh, the, the Portuguese, the Spanish, why wouldn't the British? That, that's like saying, well, I want my society. We're going to take the moral high ground, but in 100 years, we're not going to exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so, we, were, we were awful, but we were probably one of the better powers to be controlled. By, exactly. To be I mean, hindsight being twenty twenty, we've grown from that. We don't do that anymore. But you have mm. to look at it, you know that the, the, the uh, what's it called the debate fallacy called genetic fallacy. Like almost every time that somebody discusses something, oh, it, this means this, and this means that. Like, you're just talking a genetic fallacy. I cannot yeah. have an argument with you. You're trying to shut down the conversation, like you stated before. So I'll tell you right now. To, look to, to bring it to bring it back to British. Mm -hmm. horror uh, <laughs> quite a lot of dealing with the legacy of colonialism so we will find things like countries that we used to inhabit there will be stories about things that we brought back that are cursed or, or oh, whatever else yeah. you know so that there's an aspect to that i mean this isn't to say that america is not an imperial power just not the same way and yeah. i don't know that americans deal with it particularly um, oh, we're, we're divided. We're divided. Because I'll, I'll tell you right now. Uh, like, so I, I live in Germany. Why do I live in Germany? Because we won World War II and we're still here, right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's the simplified version of it. Then did the you, Germans... Sorry, sorry to be personal. Did you meet your wife through being stationed in Japan? Or... Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I worked for the Marine Corps at that time. Believe me, I'd never do that again. But uh, <laughs> as, an, as an airman, I'm not wor willingly working for the Marines again. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's exactly. So I've traveled. The only place actually I've traveled in the world that wasn't directly with the United States Department of Defense is Russia. And uh, I had a great time there. I speak a little Russian. Uh, that's so I went. But uh, every country I've lived in otherwise has either been a contractor or in the service, you know, when I was in the Air Force and so forth. Now I'm a civilian. But uh, uh, I forgot what I was saying. God damn it. <laughs> I forgot. Well, the the whole uh, you you you've been in all these other countries because of the U.S. presence. Oh yeah, there. yeah, right. The continued permanent U.S. presence. My libertarian side of me says, "Pull our troops home." I don't care what China does within China's borders. I don't care what the U.K. does within U.K. borders. I don't care what Japan does in Japan's. I I just don't. At the same time, now I'm not open border, but I'm free border. And what I mean by that is, if somebody in Saudi Arabia doesn't like the way she's being treated. She should have the right to come to America the, the, the right way, because I, I want to pull you out of there. But I don't believe we have the right to go there and say, Sharia law, down with Sharia law. If that's how that culture wants to live, I don't agree with it. But just don't bring it to me. Yeah, don't bring it here. You're fine. 
So, no. so uh, what, my, my what point... if they don't want to live that way, but are being forced to, such as like North Korea, say, you know, what what do we do there? The, 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 so this is going to sound overly overly simplistic, but sometimes, unfortunately, that's the way. To, either you rise up or you you deal with it. Yeah, mm. I, I, I mean, I, that's it. You you uh, hey, you have a government to overthrow when it's yours. Have fun with that. I mean, when when you change the government and officially ask us for help, we'll be there. Yeah. Easier said than done. Look, human nature. Uh, it's human nature, right? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Jordan Peterson, whether you like him or hate him, he came out with something. Basically, said that you'd be a Nazi in Germany during World War II time. Chances are you'd be a Nazi, whether a flag waving one or just yeah, 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 I'm a freaking Nazi. Whatever, stop, don't shoot me. Because yeah. of the way the culture was, and he, so I understand that it's difficult. Do you think it was easy for the Americans to rise up against the British? We should have lost that war. Do you think it was easy for the French to 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 rise up against themselves? I mean, the Russian Revolution, which is actually something I studied, that was not an easy thing. Sometimes the hard road is the way you've got to go, and I know that's overly simplistic. And I know somebody's gonna be like, you know, it's not that easy. How are they supposed to blah blah? blah. That's the only way it can be done, though. Now, if somebody um, asks for our help. I'm sorry, go on. So I was just gonna say, there's another aspect to the um the to the British imperialism, which I've found quite recently and found quite interesting. So that countries that we're used to control uh, are often producing horror that deals with that, that, with the legacy of imperialism. I forget the I forget the name of the show. It's on Netflix. But there's an Indian produced series in which a bunch of undead British colonial soldiers are released from a cave, and so it's 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 fascinating. And I would view that as being I'm going to look it up right now. Re reflective of British horror. It's a Netflix series. Netflix de. <laughs> oh, I I get that. I mean. Uh... If uh, if if they felt uh, if if they had if they had bad feelings about you know your your time there, then they and would look. It's understandable that. for different cultures yeah, to yeah, clash. They, they they would translate that into something uh, to deal with better. Yeah. Is you make a horror film about it, and everyone would be like yeah, the, the British, the undead British soldiers. But they're it's a way to deal with the cultural feeling. You know, like get it yeah. out. And there's a weird tension there, particularly in India, because the official language is English. You know, you've got really? Punjabi, yeah, you've got Punjabi oh, and I Hindi and, and others, but the official sort of state language is, is still is still English. And people of light skin are, are elevated in society, and they still think the world of Britain. They love a British education. They love to send people out. They you know, high tea is still a thing that happens. The hotels. I mean, let, let's be fair. West, Western. Politi uh, parliamentary or democracies and so forth did a lot of good. Now, unfortunately, we enforced it in a way that wouldn't always be good. But I, I mean, I can understand both sides in terms of I can understand how a, a traditionally Indian family be like the British were the worst thing ever. They, they, you know, they, they took away our culture. They took away who we are as a people. They took away our prominence. I mean, look, the, the Indians fought against the Greeks and the Persians and so forth. I can also see the other side that says, look, they elevate us. Look what the Arabs did to the world in in you know with, with the with the Muslim expansion, providing mathematics and astronomy and so forth. We look at them as like being savages now, but the truth of the matter is they were algebraic calculators for the longest time. They were the epitome of science for so long. There's, so, there's an interest. There's an interesting parallel there with the uh, with the British Empire because the, the the Islamic world was at the forefront of technology and mm -hmm. uh, chemistry and and so on for such a long time right up until uh the ideas behind the religion changed and it became a lot less tolerant um and that put paid to all that and mm -hmm. the british when they were originally in india were happy for indians to to govern to self-govern within india up until uh evangelical christians started moving into india and started running into trouble Always and religion, that's, man. And that's when we decided, no, nah, we're going to have to take more direct control. We can't have, you know, good good white Christian women being killed by outraged locals. We have to do something. As somebody that. who still considers himself pro-religion, well, I'm not Christian myself. I mean, I understand the importance, the, the 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 counselor effect, as I like to call it, or the community of religion. I've never understood, or at least I don't understand anymore, the concept of my God is better than your God, so I must kill you. Now, maybe that's a modern thing. Maybe if I'd lived 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, I would understand would that. 
Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but remember, I went to Lutheran school and that was kind of beat into me that everybody else is going to hell, blah, 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 you know, so on and so forth. But even back then, I just never understood the concept of, okay, so they're going to hell. Why do I care? Yeah. Like, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a died in the wool atheist. Religion's not really a big thing here in the UK. And it just strikes me as the same way it would someone killing someone else over whether Superman or Batman would win in a fight. Yeah. Is, what? No. <laughs> All right. Anyway, anyway, uh, <laughs> that got super deep, really, really fast. But uh, I, I like it. But yeah, to, uh, but my, to, most to of it recap, was related. To I, the topic. I, 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 I didn't even think about the whole British going to the countryside for safety and Americans going to the countryside to be murdered. I, like, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't click to me until you said it. That was great. I love that. Uh, people don't yeah. like to have their worldview challenged. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's uncomfortable, but it's always necessary. But uh, yeah, that's so, yeah, um, that'd be I, that. I just want to ram that home a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Survivors was a horror post-apocalyptic series here in the UK where the survivors take off and set up in a mansion and turn it into a farm. Mm -hmm. 28 days later, the end of that, they've run off to empty areas in Scotland. So you, you can you can see that there. Day of the Triffids, they run off and they set up a farm. It, it, it's such a common thing. Yeah. Um, and it's fun to play with, actually. Yeah, and the the common thing in American horror is if Violence. you're at a farm, you're gonna you're gonna be murdered by by by, by someone wearing a someone else's face because your stupid ass won't leave that farm <laughs> with some kind of power tool. Yeah, yeah, uh, some kind of power tool or 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 even something as simple as a really really big hook. It's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> are we okay, ready okay. I, I do not want to shut you down in any way shape or form if you've got more you want to talk about let us know and we'll continue to do it with that said are you ready to possibly bring in some people who are watching to talk with us uh, I'm happy to that's one more thing I think I Jim, missed please. Um, mm -hmm. British repression is one of the other things and horror is often a way to step outside those social bounds I think this is most obvious when you look at the work of Clive Barker. Up until he came out, I thought his work was a lot better, a lot edgier. Um, it was clear that, you know, after the fact, it was clear that he was working through some shit, uh, like like his own, quote, deviant sexuality or whatever. You can see that in, in Hellraiser, you know, all of that stuff. Then he came out and his stuff became a lot more boring. Um, you can I got, see the only his, thing I know from Clive Barker is Hellraiser. Literally, that's <laughs> all I know of him. You can see from his earlier work, he, he's kind of disgusted by women because he's gay, I think. And it, he, he's fascinated by birth and monsters and uh, by blows and mutations and, and things like that in a lot of his like the books of blood. Um, and then he came out and his stuff just wasn't as good for ages. Now I'm finding his work good again, but it's his children's books. <laughs> they have <laughs> well, that they have that element that was missing. Um well, what, what element is that? <sighs> Just kind of like like maybe like an individuality or, or a personality? Maybe because he can't have children himself, at least not not directly, maybe he <sighs> retains a view of children that they shouldn't be insulated and protected. And so his children's book work retains an edge that other people might want to protect children from because it's quite horrific. His his Aberat series is sort of children's books slash young adult. And it has that edge that his older repressed work does. So it, it, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I do know that a lot of British horror has that element of breaking free of the bounds of convention and the demands of class and politeness. And yeah, you know, I mean, you can see that in 28 days later. Mm. Um, yeah. It's just such an orgy of, of violence <laughs> and like that, that. And the, the whole idea of the rage virus is that it releases all this pent up right. anger that we all have all the time. You yeah, know? And ev everyone is made the same. Either yeah. you're, you're, you're a rage zombie or, you are a survivor. And it doesn't matter if you were a rich survivor, if you were a lord, or or if you were, yeah. you know, a. Uh, and then, it, and then, if you look at the soldiers uh, the, in the latter half of the film, that's you know very rigidly hierarchical. You know, they everyone follows him. He knows what's best for everybody and is willing to do what needs what he feels needs to be done. Yeah. and then that it, gets all burned down. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, that was that was the last thing I I, I yeah, okay. had, had a mental okay. note. Well, before say. we go into segment three, because uh, segment three isn't actually posted publicly, it's it, that one that part is behind a paywall. I do want to first of all thank you for being here. I had I've so far had a an amazing time, and I mean that seriously. Uh, I was a bit nervous about this. He dog knows that, but this turned out to be freaking awesome. I hope sometime in the future you come back and or we. Do the same for you as well, and and I mean that in all seriousness. Like I I, I want to talk about some other game counterculture. Challenge me more. Put make me as uncomfortable as you can because I honestly enjoy that. So uh, I, I would be more more than happy to, especially since your hours weirdly coincide with mine better than most <laughs> podcasts. 